This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today we're going to look at another lovely camera. This is the Sony Alpha A7. This is the world's first interchangeable lens mirrorless full frame camera. Very light, nice looking. We're going to look at it now. So this is the Sony Alpha A7 camera. You can see the little A7. We rotate it just like so. There it is. Sony came out with two interchangeable lens full frame cameras, the A7 and the A7R. The A7R is 36 megapixels and considerably more expensive than this one. 36 megapixels is more than most of us mere mortals need. This one is 24.3 megapixels. Plenty of megapixels for most of us. And this one sells for $19.99 US pricing here with this kit lens, which sold separately is $500. You always get a break on the kit lens when you buy it with the camera. And if you just buy the camera body alone, it is $1,700, making it marginally the most affordable full frame camera on the market. Obviously, Canon has the EOS 60 that we recently reviewed. And that one's about $100, $200 more if you're talking about just body only. And Nikon has their D610, previously the D600, minor tweak, minor update there, around the same price as the Canon. So, you know, when you're spending this much money, $100, $200, I don't think that's as important as getting the right camera for you, to be honest. So I'm not going to make a huge deal about that. When you're looking at the price of those cameras with their kit lenses, though, they are more expensive, but... You get what you pay for to a certain extent. The Canon is bundled with a really, really killer L zoom lens. And Nikon includes a pretty decent lens too. This kit lens right here, it's my least favorite part of this camera. Unfortunately, because there are only five Sony FE, it's like the E-mount lens from the Sony NEX days, only F for full frame. There's only five full frame lenses meant for this on the market right now, so you don't have a lot of choices. As we take a look, you can see right over there, this is the FE 3.5 to 5.6 in terms of aperture, 28 to 70 millimeter zoom. Since this is full frame, there's no conversion necessary. That actually what it is. What an uninspired zoom range that is, huh? We don't even get as wide as 24, let alone going out to something closer to 100. This reminds me of the capabilities of one of my old film zoom lenses back when I was just a youngster and I couldn't afford a really good lens. So the specs aren't that great. To be honest, it's not a terrible lens. It's not a junky lens. It does sell for $500 separately, but it doesn't do the camera justice. But again, because there aren't many lenses on the market, except for we'll get into the folks who have vintage glass and stuff like that they want to use, you're probably going to end up getting it with this lens. Keep in mind that any lens you get afterwards, any full frame lens meant for this is probably going to take even better photos. Some chromatic aberration, a little barrel distortion. Colors are good, but not fantastic on this. This is what I'm talking about. It has reasonably good sharpness. It has okay colors, just not super fantastic. And the rest of the camera is, well, pretty close to super fantastic. So there you have it. Speaking of your lens options, there are a bunch of adapters available so you can use other lenses. Let's get into this first. I think there's going to be two buyers for this. There's going to be the advanced home user, mom and pop. You want to take great travel photos, your kids playing sports, uh, photography is a hobby, whatever. You're not real geeky, super advanced and into vintage like a hardware, that kind of thing. You can use Leica M lenses with this, for example. You can even use Canon lenses. You can use that aforementioned Canon 24 to 105 L zoom lens with this if you get the right adapter. This gets to be a whole lot of confusion for you kind of more casual folks. Now, you hardcore people who are already snickering and thinking, yo, yo, same to you, because I have every lens adapter and every vintage lens on the market. Well, you're the other consumer who might be interested in this. You're a very advanced photographer. You have a quite a nice collection of good lenses. You're ready to use adapters up the wazoo just to get what you want. And the only thing is you're tired of carrying around those big, heavy, full-frame cameras. So you just want something light, spontaneous, portable. You won't have to have back surgery if you carry this. One pound. Wow. Compare that to 1.7 pounds for the lightest SLR, digital SLR, full-frame cameras. Obviously, you're saving some weight. But let's talk a little bit more about lenses because that's such an important part of interchangeable lens and digital SLR photography. Now, interchangeable lens means you can't interchange the lenses. It's called interchangeable lens instead of digital SLR because it doesn't have the usual single lens reflex. That's what SLR is. No mirror in there bouncing around the light to go to the viewfinder to go out to the lens and so on. So, turn this guy around. We take off his lens by pressing the release. Pretty standard stuff there. There we go. See, no little mirror. Bouncing around, there's just our full frame sensor inside. 
That is an E mount size. Aha, uh -huh. so let's take our Sony NEX5. This is the original 2010 model NEX5, which is one of the smallest NEXs. Love this camera, been using it since, well, 2010 when it came out. Even a little bit smaller, obviously, then the NEX7 got bigger, so there's that. Anyway, it uses the E mount lenses. The same story when the NEX came out, there weren't many lenses at first, and that was the drawback. It was great, you could change the lenses, but there wasn't much you could change them to. Sony now has a broader range, and you can actually put these on. Honest to goodness, there it goes. It's going to rotate right on, and it's going to work. So there it is. We have the kit zoom lens from the NEX on here. Now, I actually tested this with a better lens than this kit zoom NEX lens, a 50 millimeter 1.8 lens, prime lens. And we'll show you some shots. We'll splice them in right now. You have two options if you're going to use one of the NEX E lenses versus the FE full frame lenses with this. You can either have it vignette, do absolutely nothing, and you'll see it depends on the lens generally. You, you, how wide or how telephoto it is about how much vignetting you'll get. Not a lot, a lot of vignetting on the 50 millimeter. And you can also have it auto detect. And what it's going to do is going to reduce the resolution of the camera and use a smaller section of the sensor. So that gives you some versatility because there's a decent number of NEX E lenses on the market now. Personally, I think that they're still a little bit overpriced for what you get those NEX lenses. But then again, why would you want to do that. Maybe with the vignetting and you can crop it yourself, compose your shot as you see fit and keep in mind that you're going to have black borders around it. But otherwise, why would you want to reduce the resolution? You went out and bought this full frame camera and then you're going to drop it down to effectively APS-C. Mm, not a good idea. Next option and a better option in my opinion, this is the Sony Alpha 65, which is an APS-C size sensor camera. That doesn't matter so much as the fact is I have a SAM lens on a Sony A alpha mount lens and this one is designed for a full frame 50 millimeter 1.8 a more affordable lens generally speaking too than the one for the NEX and this you can use not directly on the body but you can get an adapter Sony sells an adapter there's two different versions there's a $200 adapter and there's a $350 adapter the $350 adapter adds a translucent mirror in between these are kind of big chunky adapters and the only drawback is you're going for this little guy right here because this is something you can actually call this little guy right here. It's light, it's small. As you start adding these adapters on that are about yay thick, you know, and you're, you're increasing the weight of the product and the size of the product, so still. But you get a better selection of full-frame lenses if you go with that A-mount adapter. And lastly, like I mentioned, there are Metabones adapters, so you can use things like Canon lenses, Nikon lenses. You can use Leica M lenses. Uh, you can use manual focus lenses. And depending on the adapter, you may or may not get autofocus. So keep that in mind, too, for you folks who are more casual style photographers that don't really groove on manual focus. But there are some good Metabones adapters that do support focus autofocus on this and again they're going to be about three hundred dollars and they are going to add some size and weight onto the camera again the a7 and the a7r are either incredibly lens limited cameras if you're just going to go for the lenses that are designed for it or they're one of the most versatile cameras in the world because you can get all kinds of adapters really depends on what kind of shooter you are and how much money you have again the adapters run 200 300 350 dollars and then depends on the lenses you want to use them with. Some of them might be affordable, some of them might be quite expensive. So there you go. All right, so let's get back to those Sony FE lenses. Some are released, some are still to come to hit the marketplace. Obviously, this one exists, the kit lens right here, and that's the most affordable at $500, or effectively less if you get it bundled and it has a kit lens. There's a higher quality version. There is the Vario Tessar FE 24 to 70, and that's an F4 constant aperture lens. That is a nice lens right there. That's a $1,200 lens too. So again, when you're talking about how affordable this camera is relative to some other full frame cameras, keep in mind that Sony lenses and certainly the, the Zeiss lenses particularly are pricey. This one is just a Sony lens, kit lens, by the way, it's certainly not a Zeiss lens at that price. There's a nice prime. It's the 55 millimeter f 1.8. That one is a thousand dollars, though. Oh my goodness, right? When you think about a Canon or a Nikon, you can get a full frame, nice, nice 1.8 aperture, 50 millimeter lens. 
well, you can go with the lower quality ones as low as like 100 or 125 bucks, and the step up lenses are usually moving up to f1.4 at that point, and those are $300, sometimes more. So the lenses are expensive for this, just saying. Next, there's a Zeiss 35mm f2.8, and that's a nice walkabout lens for those of you who really like the whole like a rangefinder experience. It's a, it's a good street lens. And lastly, there's a long zoom lens, 70 to 200, also f4 constant, aperture, $1,500. Huh. All right, so now we've picked on the poor camera because you either have to get into the land of complex adapters to use other lenses or buy some fairly expensive Sony lens to use this full frame camera to full, its fullest potential. I will not beat a dead horse. You get the idea about that. Let's talk about the rest of the camera because it really is a lovely camera that takes some pleasing shots. First off, it's obviously quite small. If you have big hands, if you love the feel of a giant SLR in your hands or digital SLR, you're probably going to find this to be a little bit cramped. Now, I have pretty big hands. I'm almost six feet tall and it, it is a little small to hold, but you know what? Who cares? You can take this thing anywhere and you don't feel so intrusive when you're doing so. Everybody doesn't look at you and say, oh, you're the person with the big camera who's going to take my picture next, aren't you? Nice, subtle, small, so I can live with that. The only thing I don't like is the shutter button is over here, not over here. It, it, it's just barely hand cramping enough to go over here, but we have a dial control. Sony likes to put controls everywhere on this. We got dial control here. We have another dial control here. So this, I, I keep missing. It takes a while to get used to the fact that it's actually back here. As you can see, that's your on off switch. The rest of the controls are good. I actually like the Sony Alpha interface. That's what this uses, I, not some, NX dumbed down kind of UI on this and we've got programmable buttons on here. We have our EV control. I love just having an EV dial right here, plus and minus three AVs and one third increments. And here the usual selector, manual focus, uh, manual shooting priority, aperture priority, intelligent auto, panorama, video shooting. It's all right there. Programmable stuff too. On the back, lots of little buttons given houses. What a small camera that we have right here. We've got our autofocus, manual focus switch, AE lock, function button that brings up quick functions when you're shooting. The usual, every camera has it, dial and rocker control right there. Playback button, your delete button. All pretty intuitive, pretty easy to use. And our menu button is up here. And we have a big eye cup around the electronic viewfinder that we'll talk about in a bit and the usual diopter control up here. And Sony's proprietary hot shoe flash up here that works with microphones, flashes, stuff like that. There are accessories for this. Sony has a $550 flash. Again, wow, that's pretty pricey, isn't it? But it's an interesting flash. It does both video lighting and it does flash. There's a battery grip for this for 300 bucks. can hold up to two batteries in the base. There's a hot shoe stereo microphone that's $160. So they're pretty good with the accessories and the, the usual cases and all that sort of thing. On the bottom, we have our usual tripod mount, tripod mount over here, and this is the battery door. Battery, same as on the NEXs, it's the 1080 milliamp W Info Lithium Series battery. Just like the RX10 also, that uses that battery, and just like the RX10, this has a USB port. So you plug in the camera, and it has a little USB-based charger, and you plug, you charge the camera, the battery while it's in the camera. I th find it a little insulting for a $2,000 camera that they don't give me an external charger in the box as well. It's nice if you're in the field to be able to plug it into a cigarette lighter charger and charge up the battery on the go, but at the same time I want to be able to just have a secondary battery say and charge that up and have it ready to go. You're gonna have to buy the separate charger if you want to do that which is 50 bucks. Taking a look on the side over here we see we have an NFC logo. That's to make pairing easier over Wi-Fi. You can use that to transfer images and video to and from your smartphone, your tablet, which is pretty cool, that kind of thing. And you touch them together and it gets them talking to each other. You can use this with a Wi-Fi direct kind of mode or you can actually connect to an access point. You can control photo shooting, but not video shooting, by the way. And this little door right here is where the SD card slot is compatible with ultra high speed and SDXC cards. And differently, most cards go shooting out that away. And this one, because it's a small camera, they can't really have room for it. This one goes in and out that away. And on the other side, under some classy doors right here, we have 
red and green for our stereo microphone in and the camera also has its own microphone by the way and headphone out good to see something you'd want to see on a camera that's expensive professional and we also have our micro hdmi and our multi-purpose av port over here now this can output uncompressed hdmi just like the rx10 we recently reviewed so if you have an external recorder that is awesome if you want to plug this into a 4k tv you can actually show photos going out at 4k resolution speaking of nice looking camera now you know maybe this appear, appeals to those who are older than 25 and really like that retro kind of like a rangefinder angular look and it is a very angular design obviously shiny black magnesium weather resistant weather sealed casing on it the usual textured battery grip right here i think it's a very nice looking camera nobody would ever look at this and say anything less than wow that looks like it must be a pretty good camera and again it is small and let's compare it compare it to the canon eos 6d which is canon's smallest and most affordable full frame digital slr traditional slr so you can see the difference and you can see there's a significant size difference in addition to the weight difference there where it's three quarters of a pound lighter this one right here now some of that's going to depend on the lens that you're using this canon lens is kind of a beefy big lens so it, it's part of what makes it look so well darn big and scary Sony's lenses do tend to be compact, even their Zeiss lenses, so there are very few that are what I would call big and scary. Speaking of their zoom lenses, I really wish they had like a 24 to 105. Okay, yes, you can get use the adapter and use this big Canon lens. What does this big Canon lens look like on this body, though? Kind of, hmm, funny. On the back, we have a 3-inch LCD. This is articulating, so we can go out like that. We can pull it out like that. We can go down like that. You cannot pick it up, swivel it, and drop it down below like you can, say, on the Sony Alpha 65 that we just showed you. One megapixel equivalent. It's a pretty good viewfinder. It's bright enough to see outdoors. There is an outdoor brightness mode, but what's really very nice is the electronic viewfinder. 2.4 megapixel equivalent. Very bright. Nice high resolution there. 100% coverage just a dream to use. Now, it's a little bit weird if you're used to a regular SLR, digital SLR with the, the pass-through glass kind of thing. It's a little bit hyper bright and vivid and better than life, but I think that you'll get used to it. And I find that the, the eye cup does a good job of keeping light out, which is quite important here since you're looking at well, artificially generated light on the inside. Now looking through the back LCD of the camera, you can see this has the zebra features. Again, just like the RX10, like some video cameras, this tells me where things are going to be overexposed. And you have 30% leeway. You can go for anywhere from 70% to 100% warning on your zebras. See the little red highlights there? It might be a little hard to see. This also has focus peaking. Very nice if you really want to do serious depth of field shots. And also if you happen to be using older manual focus lens with, lenses with this as well. Other than that, it's pretty much absolutely normal stuff right here. We got our ISO reporting. We're in intelligent auto mode right now, by the way. Aperture, speed. If we hit the FN button, not much we can do because we're in intelligent auto, but we can do a few things like here. Direct manual focus mode, for example, is available. And we have flash control here, but aha, notice there is no flash built in on this camera. You're going to have to buy an external flash, which again will make it a bit bigger, heavier, and more expensive. So keep that in mind. Some people absolutely never use the flash. Some people only want to use external flashes anyway, nothing on camera. That's up to you. You know best what it is that you do. Speaking of drive modes, here are our drive modes. Obviously, we've got single shooting right here, continuous shooting. Speed priority. Why does that exist? I'll tell you about it. Because this shoots two and a half frames per second. If you're in regular continuous shooting mode, you need continuous autofocus, for example. And if you switch to speed priority, it will focus for the first shot it takes and go with that focus for the rest of the shots. And then that will get you five frames per second. In addition, we have the usual self-timer stuff going on here, bracketing. You know, you get the usual ideas. Uh, speaking of the, uh, the continuous shooting mode and the speed, one thing about mirrorless cameras is a lot of folks who shoot action are not as fond of them because you're not getting exactly real-time view of what you're shooting. You're getting it reported through an electronic viewfinder which is giving you a window onto what the lens is seeing electronically rather than looking through the glass. That combined with the lower shooting speeds on this means I, if I was a sports photographer I wouldn't choose this camera honestly. Now how about focusing speeds? It's not bad. It's not the fastest that I've seen to be honest. Listen to that shutter. Oh my God, that is just going to scream attention, isn't it? 
when you press and hold, you can get some pretty quick continuous shots right there. And focusing speeds are not hideous. Again, not the best that I've seen. One thing about this camera I've noticed is it's a little bit funny sometimes about what it chooses to focus on. It's pretty easy to get blurry shots, and maybe that's why some early reviewers complain that this was a sometimes blurry camera. You really have to pay attention to your focus peaking and make sure that it is focusing on the thing that you want. And you can use manual if you want. By the way, this has both the usual contrast detection, autofocus, 25 points, and phase detection, 117 points. That's actually something that the more expensive and higher megapixel A7R doesn't have. It just has the usual contrast. It doesn't have the phase detection in addition. And keep in mind, while I was shooting, I have it set to save both JPEG and RAW files simultaneously. What about the, the JPEGs on this? Some people have given Sony a hard time for over-sharpening JPEGs and having really heavy-handed noise reduction. Yeah, they are a little heavy-handed on the noise reduction, and I think the sharpening is something that a lot of people will appreciate. For those of you who, again, who are the more casual shooters who are more likely to use JPEG, you like really sharp-looking shots. Most people do. I'm not going to fault them too much, because if you're a serious photographer, you're probably going to go with RAW. Now we're going to switch over to video mode, and one thing that is really wonderful about mirrorless cameras is you can get constant autofocus on these. Something on digital SLRs you just don't get. There you autofocus once, and then afterwards you have to manually pull focus yourself. Not so here. So for those of you who want to shoot video, full 1080p video recording, 30 frames per second. You can do 60i as well. You can do 60p. And your highest bit rate is all AVC HD, so you video recording snobs who like higher bit rate formats, well, sorry, that's the only codec you get here, but you can do 24 megabit per second on 60i and 28 megabit per second on 60p, which honestly is pretty nice for a lot of us. So we've got it in video mode, and where's the video record button? They moved it over to the side, not over here where it is on most other Sony NEX and RX10 kind of cameras, but... And this is easy as pressing that button, and you can get full manual control if you want. Now I'm just pressing the autofocus, and if we move around, it's going to continue to focus just fine. Very little focus hunting. It's pretty good. It really is. Now, the RX10 is a real genius at recording video, and some people have said that it's better than this camera. And the RX10 does indeed sample the whole sensor for equivalent of 5K worth of data, where as you get the usual line skipping on this camera here, but Looking at video from both of these, this really holds it its own. And is it the full frame? Maybe it is, but we have some sample waterfall video we're going to show you right now because something that's quick moving like that for CMOS based cameras between rolling shutter and the moire that you might get can often look bad, but it did actually a really pretty good job. Now, while we're on the blurry shot discussion there, you know what I think happens to a lot of people too? Full frame sensors, you're collecting a lot of data. You really need to hold them quite still when you're taking a picture. When you're, you're holding two and a half or three pounds worth of full frame digital SLR, that's not so much of a problem. Handshake, no, because you, you're holding a big heavy solid mass. This guy is very light. There's a tendency to use it like a point and shoot. Flap it around, take a picture. You're going to get blurry pictures. You have to really pay attention, I notice, with this to hold it quite still. Obviously, you tripod shooters, no problem for you. You're on a tripod. You're going to be very still, but I think a lot of people are going to buy this camera because it's small, portable, easy to carry around to shoot run and gun in the field. So keep that in mind. Until I started paying attention, I was getting some blurry shots too, and I have very steady hands. I'll often do handheld 1 40th of a second shots wide open aperture on a full frame digital SLR and, and really not introduce any blur. With this guy, you got to be careful with that. So if you're shaky Jake, if you do a lot of gel cola, it might not be the camera for you. This does have an autofocus illuminator, even though there's no flash and it's amber and my word, it is a beacon unto the world. Anybody that you're shooting, if it's a baby, they will cry. Also, oddly, it doesn't really speed up autofocusing times. If anything, it seems to make them worse. Turn it off. The people you take pictures of will thank you, and you'll get faster shots and focusing. Just like the RX10 this, and also the A7R, this has Sony's new Bions X processor. My world, it's a great improvement over the last generation Bions processor. Much, much faster. HDR is 
instantaneous. It was some of the older cameras, it was like sit there and wait while it thought about it and thought about it some more and thought about it some more. And you're like, is it really worth it? I don't know. This one, instantaneous, very fast processor. I put to really great use in the RX10 where it does sample the, the full sensor for video. But even here, excellent job, very good image interpretation. Now, how did the photos actually look? We're going to splice in some photos so you can see that we took with this camera. And they're very nice. Honestly, I personally feel like I don't see quite the warmth and the depth that I see in some full-frame digital SLR cameras. So, I'm not just talking about achieving depth of field. Yes, you can achieve depth of field in the target that you want, especially when you, once you get used to the focus peaking. But there's a little bit more dimensionality in the Nikon D610 and the Canon EOS 6D. Of course, what you might lose in subtlety there, you gain in great portability here. In terms of color balance, it's on the cool side. We know that with the RX10 as well, which some people like. Right now, that kind of edgy, high contrast, cooler look is in. I also personally prefer a little bit of a warmer tone, but I do a lot of portraits and, as you've noticed, a lot of pretty kitty photos too, where warmer tones are preferable. Now, you can change the color balance after the fact of developing the raw files in Photoshop or even tweaking the JPEGs, but one thing I noticed with this kit lens, and that's again the problem here, the kit lens is just okay, and even with the Sony E-Series 50mm 1.8 lens, I, I didn't see quite the, the, the warm, vivid highlights that I saw on the other cameras. However, the black areas, my goodness, this is great at resolving detail into shadows, and it has great dynamic range. It's really one of the best I've seen. And, the, the, the sharpness of the photos, really very good. Even with just this OK Kit lens, really, really sharp. So sharp, modern, edgy looking photos is what I would describe this guy is producing. So how about low light photography? It's quite good up to about ISO 6400. Now, personally, I would turn off Sony's noise reduction and use Noise Ninja. That's my favorite PC and Mac noise reduction utility, but that's up to you. I think a lot of the more casual shooters will actually enjoy what Sony does with noise reduction. Everything is smooth and continuous, not dotty, not bumpy, good enough, hey, nice contrast, all that kind of thing. So pretty good in low light. Again, the focusing speeds are not the fastest, at least not with this kit lens or with the, the E-mount Sony lens that we tried with this uh, it has it, it has to work a little bit. It's no Canon EOS 60, which is the low light focusing maniac among full frame cameras right now. But it can take some pleasing shots, certainly. And the full frame sensor lets in a lot of light. That's why you want a full frame sensor. More light, more image data captured. So therefore, better low light and night shots. camera also has a GPS built in, so those nice consumer features, GPS and Wi-Fi both being in there. I know this GPS does drag down the battery life a little bit. And speaking of battery life, just like the NEX cameras, you, you, you got a pretty high-powered camera here, not that huge a battery. Battery life, I'm averaging about 300 shots. I'd shoot, shoot dual JPEG and RAW on that, so that's about as good as it gets. A lot of people who use this more seriously and professionally will obviously want to get a couple of other batteries and that external battery charger. So that's the Sony Alpha A7 camera. It's available now, again, $2,000 with the kit lens. Around $1,700 without the kit lens means you're probably going to want a kit lens. There aren't many lenses you can choose for this right now. Anyway, it's certainly an engineering achievement, and it's a dream come true for those people who really want full-frame quality but don't want to carry a heavier camera around. There are some drawbacks, as we discussed, but still we got to hand it to Sony. They keep innovating. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full review, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.